Hello, this is Dr. Heath Van Horn. I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the reading this week, uh, Ethernet. So when you first read this, um, this was document was written for a computer science audience, and you guys are not required, and I'm certainly not expecting you to know the information to a computer science level. However, when you guys encounter the math part of this discussion of this uh, document, uh, you guys freak out. Um, don't freak out. Just read the theory, because the theory is very uh, applicable. Read the theory and keep in mind that the theory is what you're supposed to grasp from this, because you're going to be putting the theory into effect um, soon. So let's go over this Ethernet real quick. Uh, this is the history of Ethernet. Uh, Ethernet has remained largely unchanged. I mean, every year they update the standards and they make it a little bit better, but the way it was developed back in the 70s uh, is still largely how it works today. Um, so here they're talking about the classic Ethernet, and I know history is boring uh, to a lot of you. The history is important because it helps you understand why the packets are, are moved in the way that they are moved. And that helps you understand a little bit more about how Ethernet works. So when you read this stuff, just keep in mind. So here's when the network interface card just was introduced in the 70s. Um, we're still using it pretty much in the same way that we're doing it now. It, there's a little bit more efficiencies, there's a little bit more error checking, but the network interface card still largely works uh, the way it always has. The only difference is, is back in the day, you'd have to have a terminator, um, that's what they're called, a 50 ohm terminator at each end of the cable. So that way the loop or the, the Ethernet cable would appear that there was a continuous loop of machines that it could talk to. And if you ever dropped one of those off, then the whole network for every machine would die. So it's just trying to tell you um, that that was the way it was because part of the signaling was, if you didn't have that dummy load on there, if this guy here was trying to transmit, it's going to listen to see if anything else is on the network. Well, if this is an open, if it wasn't terminated, there'd be noise on the network and it would never transmit. So that's why that's an important uh, thing for them to discuss, because they are looking for silence on the network. And then if they encounter somebody else, they call that a collision. And when they have a con collision, both parties, let's say it was D over here, both parties, they stop communicating. And so what they have to do is figure out a, what they ran into was that if both mechanisms detected collisions or noise traffic at the same time, what would happen is they would both stop for the same amount of time and they'd retransmit. If you can think of like old comedy shows where people are trying to get through the door at the same time and they both back up saying, oh, the other guy needs to go first and they both do it again and then they both do it again. That's kind of how the network packeting worked. Um, and to resolve that, there's a cool little formula down here that you guys are just going to love, especially uh, Jamal. And the formula um, is going to drive you crazy. Don't care about the formula. All you want to care about, it'll get there. All you want to care about is that there is a mechanism where when a collision occurs between points Charlie and Delta, that Charlie will start again in a random number of milliseconds and Delta will start in a different random number of milliseconds. So Charlie might start again in 10 milliseconds and Delta might be 127 milliseconds. So that way they do not both try to start transmitting at the exact same time. I talk a lot about seconds and milliseconds, but you guys have no idea how absolutely fast this is. So even a brief pause 
causes um, lag, but that brief pause is necessary for Ethernet to work. So um, they talk about some terminologies here. This is pretty good stuff. Carrier sense. There is no carrier in uh, Ethernet. The carrier was a, a hangover from telestial communications where uh, AM radios, they require a carrier. If you don't have a carrier on your receiver, uh, if you only receive the intelligence and not the carrier, you cannot uh, un uh, decode the signal and receive your sports broadcast. So that was kind of left over, but it acts like a carrier. It's just not there. There is no literal, oh yeah, they say it right here. There's no literal carrier frequency that needs to be sensed. Um, it just acts like if there's no carrier, it doesn't work. So um, it's just a hangover name. It's not critical. I'm certainly not going to quiz you guys on that, but you should understand what carrier sense multiple multiple access collision detect means. Okay. Um, let's see here. There's a lot of different formats of Ethernet. Uh, thick coax that was the big one. Twisted pair is what we're using now. Uh, thick, thick coax, you actually had to use a drill uh, to get in there, but that's fine. Uh, repeaters are signal amplifiers. Yeah, those are, repeaters are still used today, especially in fiber optics and stuff, but they're used in a different manner um, where back in the day, repeaters would be between PCs, and that's hardly ever the case. It's usually repeaters are used between cities. Uh, a repeater with more than two hertz is commonly called a hub. Um, the hubs is what generated star topologies. Uh, in case you don't know, you know, it looks like a star. There's a computer, the, the computer in the middle. And then you have computers in all directions, so it looks like a star. So that's a star topology, if in case you forgot. Uh, bridges, which are now called switches. Um, repeaters act at the bit later and switch reads and forwards packets. So they don't actually look at the little bits. They, they just do the whole thing. Uh, any collision that occurs on a network is propagated by a hub where switches do not allow the collisions to propagate. So that's kind of why uh, hubs are used very rarely. But we will, or I think your first project is to make a hub. Um, and so that way you can see how those packets crash and uh, uh, resolve them. <laughs> yeah, so uh, hubs, if you want to monitor an Ethernet signal, yes, you still use hubs. You also will use something called promiscuous mode. Hackers love promiscuous mode because every packet will come to your IP point. And so uh, <coughs> to avoid that on people, um, many NIC cards don't allow promiscuous mode. If you've seen my demonstration of uh, how to uh, intercept wireless signals, I have to use a certain um, wireless access point so that way I can put it in promiscuous mode. Otherwise, it would not work. All right. Um, they're talking about the different uh, formats. So here they're talking about how a packet is formed. So your data, if you had just a little piece of data in here, you would add, when it transmits, the NIC card would add the destination address and the source address, the type, and the check code. So um, that's what makes it a packet. The data is the individual ones and zeros. So a hub 
doesn't care about any of this stuff. This stuff is not even used in a hub. All it sees is the ones and zeros and it resends it everywhere. So if there is a collision, the collision gets sent everywhere as well. So that becomes a problem. Uh, here they talk about maximum packet length. This does not have much to do with what you guys are doing. It has a lot to do with computer scientists who figure out new algorithms for moving uh, information from one place to another within that limitation of the packet length. Uh, every Ethernet card has its own physical address, the MAC address. You need to be using that. Uh, you'll be referencing that a lot. So uh, IP address is different than a MAC address. And then oh, here, here they talk about promiscuous mode. Let's read that. That's good stuff. Uh, multicast is used like uh, when you transmit something live. So that way, if there's an issue, they just drop it. So here's how a MAC address is created. So the first three bytes indicates the manufacturer and the IEEE sets those. Um, and then the next three are uh, the serial number of that particular card. Um, virtual machines do have their own ethernet address, their own MAC addresses. That's why when you look at stuff and, and uh, I guess we won't be looking at stuff in class. I'll make a video where we're looking at um, packets and from those packets, you can determine whether or not something is a virtual machine or not, just because of the way uh, the ethernet address is labeled, the MAC address is. So here they talk a little bit about the LAN layer. That's why last chapter they talked about the different uh, layers. Um, so all of the LAN layer does is provides the mechanism for addressing a packet and sending it from one station to another. So there's the MAC address, the sub layer, and the LLC. So that way things can be moving around. There's nothing here to worry about. Here's where the math starts to get uh, confusing a little bit, but um, you guys can handle it. The whole idea is that there's a time slot. So each, each uh, NIC card will send a packet for a certain time and so if we look here at t the time t is for time and zero is for a unit measure it doesn't matter if these are seconds or milliseconds or microseconds it doesn't matter so at t zero that's when the packet from a is starting to send and right now b has nothing but silence it takes time yes the the signals travel at the speed of light but it's hard to imagine how fast the speed of light is when you consider how many miles of cable uh, a packet goes through before it even gets to its destination. So that speed of light, there is some significantly um, uh, gaps in the time. So here at T0, B says there's nothing on the line, nothing on the line, nothing on the line. Nothing on the line, nothing on the line, nothing on the line, nothing on the line, nothing on the line. It's still nothing on the line at this point, so it decides to go ahead and transmit. Well, what that does is it creates that huge collision right here. And that collision reverberates all the way back to A. So B detects the collision which is basically, here's a bunch of unintelligible garbage. And then eventually, you have to propagate all this time back to A. So A understands that everything it just sent was unintelligible at the other end. So it just takes a while for this uh, system to occur, and that's how collisions occur. Collisions are normal in Ethernet. It is designed to handle collisions. It's designed to have collisions. Um, there are collisionless uh, protocols out there, but 
they have such a high overhead and the specialty equipment that it's just not becoming um, feasible. All right. You do not need to worry about this stuff. Okay. That is not important. I will not quiz you on that. I want you to set up a network. I'm not quizzing you on the very individual numbers. Okay. Um, here is the length of a bit. Yeah, so don't worry about this math. This is all math. You don't have to worry about it. This, however, is very important. A math maximum packet size. So if you're transmitting stuff or if you're trying to figure out where the lag is coming from, you have to remember that each packet only holds 1,500 bytes. That's not very much information. Okay. They do that on purpose. So, therefore, you can't lose anything. Okay, here's where they talk about the back-off time. Again, do not worry about the formula. Just understand what the back-off time means. It means that PCA and PCB will restart their transmissions at different times. So, that way, they don't keep repeating the collision over and over and over again. All right. Here's another mechanism of showing you a diagram. It's actually a pretty good diagram of showing you where collisions happen and how they continue their resuming of uh, transmission. So that's that's pretty good. This is the walkthrough of that. Take your pencil and read the walkthrough and understand how these work. Um, it will greatly help your understanding of establishing a network. Uh, the capture effect, um, that doesn't happen too often, but it happens. Um, it's just saying that when you have collisions, one PC can try, can dominate the, the, the whole system, but that doesn't usually last very long. Uh, hackers can take advantage of that and flood a network, but um, there's a lot of mechanisms in play, which we'll read about later, that stop that from happening. Hubs, which are basically repeaters, uh, change the topology, but not really, they didn't change the use on, on what they do. Um, there are errors, that's what the CRC error code is. We will get into that in a later chapter. Oh yeah, there's the chapter. So we'll get into that in a later chapter. Um, CSMA is non-persistent because it is waiting for um, the line of busy. It just randomly starts listening again. It's persistent if it's waiting for the line to clear. So it's actually listening for silence. That means it's persistent. Um, not critical, but it is handy to know this information. How much time is wasted on collisions? Actually, a lot. Um, it is not an efficient way of transmission. However, like I said before, there are other ways of doing transmissions, but it can be quite um, specialized and you really got to have clean lines. And, and in the United States, we got so much copper in the ground from uh, the works projects in the 40s and 50s that we're still using that infrastructure for a lot of our transmissions. So here they're trying to talk a bit how um, across time, how the packets get sent. So here's a collision, we send a packet. Oh, another collision, we send a packet. So here's a longer packet, more collisions. And so they're, all they're trying to do is say, hey, you know, your, um, your NIC cards spend a lot of time listening and waiting for their turn. Um, what happens is, though, is because those times are recorded in microseconds or milliseconds, it really isn't that much time. So here they talk about throughputs and math. You really don't need all this. It's kind of nice to know that 
generally you get 70% 70, 70 of your capacity. All right. You can use the Aloha model. That's just a, what, uh, a way to measure. That was before Ethernet um, came about. But its throughput is about the same. Again, there's a bunch of formulas here. Don't worry about the formulas, OK? All right, don't worry about the formulas. The formulas are not important. Math warning, yeah, OK. So yeah, if you guys solve this, I'll be really impressed. However, I'm not asking you to, OK? Yeah, these are not central to applying the model. Yeah, you do not need to. Um, we do not ask that. All you have to know is that as time gets larger, the time gets shorter. Okay. Um, Ethernet, uh, during one Ethernet time slot, there's no way to detect collisions because they have not reached the sender yet. So it has to rely on collisions to know when the line is busy. Um, the Aloha time set has a little bit different time length, so that's why it's saying that's a little bit different. So there is a difference between those two models. So now we're in fast Ethernet, which is 100 megabits, and you're going to encounter these terms. Ethernet is 10 megabits. Fast Ethernet is 100. So um, that came around about, I don't know, 20-some years ago. Oh, yeah, there's a date. Um, so fast views the net became cool. That's when I started playing video games. It was awesome. Um, it does not all align. This is good reading here on how fast these really are. There's no formulas in here. There's a lot of numbers. It's just trying to tell you uh, how fast Ethernet works. And then there's gigabit. And so gigabit still relatively new um, in the in the concept of computers, it's still relatively new. And there it's using uh, microseconds. So that, or yeah, microseconds. So that's way, because the time slots are so much faster, um, that that's why we can increase our, our megabits. So the faster your time slot, the quicker you can detect a collision and you can stop both systems from transmitting, and one of them will get their data through. And the faster you can do that, the faster you can transmit stuff. The, the basic, all the stuff you've read up to now is still in play. It isn't like they did some magic number and said, hey, you know, we're going to just create more bandwidth. That's not what happens. What happens is that they're able to more carefully calculate the time slots. All right. So gigabit is now almost as fast as writing to the hard drive. OK, so now keeping stuff on the cloud is no longer a time constraint. It used to be that you wouldn't upload and download a lot of data because um, keeping it on your computer would be faster access. That's no longer the case, thanks to gigabit. There are lots of different standards. Um, you don't have to worry about that. Ethernet switches. So uh, you can get your own Cisco gear that you'll see in the videos. You can get your own Cisco kits for about $400 with two switches, two routers, um, and a, uh, lots of patch cords. So it has, the prices come down quite a bit. All right. Here is a very important concept to understand. If the switch does not have a forwarding table, they talk about forwarding tables up above. If they do not have a forwarding table, then it will learn where the information is supposed to go, which port that information is supposed to be on. So it builds a learning table, but if it doesn't have anything, if the table is blank, and you'll see this, and I'll point it out to you when, um, when I make the videos for actually setting up the equipment. 
it will fall back to flooding. It will just send out, and, and it's called a who is. Who is? And it sends it out to everybody until somebody responds and it says, ah, I'll write that down in my little book, and now I know where that packet will go from now on. So it, it's this is very important to consider. You do not have to figure out all these terms. However, this, I don't know how to explain this any clearer to people. This is a really good diagram, so uh, study this. This is a good walkthrough. It, it's not the prettiest diagram in the world, but I don't know how to make it any clearer than this. Um, if you guys have problems with this, let me know. So all it is is it's walking you through here. It's saying in the diagram above, each switch tables are indicated by listening near each interface the destinations. So remember, um, in Ethernet, they are listening to the MAC addresses, not the IP address, the MAC address. So A sends to B. So A wants to send to B. So all so when A sends something all the way to B, every single I don't know if I have a little icon thingy here. Every single one of these then learns where A is. Because as the packet moves through the mechanism, as the packet moves, S1 says A, that packet came from A, and A is located here. Switch 2 says A is located. So they're learning. See, that's where this A nomenclature is coming from. That S3 is learning that A packets come from this port. They haven't labeled this port yet because that gets on later. But they have learned that A, all packets from A come on this port. So therefore, anytime somebody says send to A, they know to return that packet, they just push the whole packet through to the port that they know A is on. So that so if you had a packet here, you would just go, okay, I need to push it that way. This guy says I need to push it this way. This guy says I need to push it this way. And then finally it gets back to A. And it's one of those things where it's kind of convoluted and will tell you draw it out like I've done here. And it takes a few minutes of thought, but once you get it, it, it doesn't quickly leave you. So, all right. And this is all the walkthrough of how that works. Um, the cam table. Um, yeah, that's the, I don't, I've never heard it called the cam table, but somebody probably out there talks to it. Algorithms. Um, don't get caught up in the math, the algorithms, and the redundancy, okay? So you need a spanning tree. All it is is saying another way of explaining this diagram. Because you need to be able to close the loop, otherwise the packet just gets lost and discarded. And that's what all this is about. All right. Here's another diagram. It's a very same diagram. And all it's saying here is that there's a priority. And when there are this priority, so S1, switch 1, is the root device and since they are directly connected to s2 and s4 they will enable interfaces to get to s1 so anything out here in this area and this area when they send a packet to s4 they already have this connection memorized all the way back to s1 And I know that's a little kind of hard to understand, but until that connection is made, and I will make a video on this so that way you guys can see it, until that connection is made, 
you'll get an error in that packet. You'll, you'll get an error saying, hey, that packet was not delivered. However, because um, the first time that packet is sent, it is learning the table. Then after that, it'll be like, oh, yeah, no problem. I know where that goes. So the first packet is essentially lost and retransmitted just so that way um, this path from S5, S6, S3 can make their way to S1 without any hurdles through S2 and S4. Here's a very good picture of, of a tree and how this works. I wish I had a little bit more penmanship on these so that way I could draw on this. But you can see S1 talks to all these different mechanisms and cloud storage. Okay. And that's if you walk through the read through and walk through this, it'll start to make sense. Um, I wish there was a better way for me to say that, but there isn't. So this is the walkthrough, and you'll see how this works. A virtual LAN. Uh, VLAN, you guys are familiar with setting up a VLAN. All that is is that it's a LAN inside of a LAN, so that way it looks like it's a logical LAN, even though there's equipment in between that really is not part of the LAN. So here you can use the colors. I kind of like this. It's a little non-standard, but he's trying to reach out to you guys. So um, if you're sending out a VLAN and you're trying to send it from switch one or B1 here, this will only go to switches that are blue. It will not be sent to those that are red. That's what a VLAN is. It is being sorted ahead of time so you know where the packets are going without involving the other nodes of the network and causing more collisions. So the more you reduce the amount of traffic on these lines, the, more, the fewer collisions you receive, and with the fewer collisions, the faster your speed. All right, so um, spanning tree mechanism is still good. Um, there is another way of getting away from distributed. It's still largely being used that same way, though. All right, so that's all of, about the reading. Um, I highly recommend you try to read through it again. You do not need to focus on the formulas or the individual speeds. That is not within the realm of um, this course. Uh, that is more of a computer science um, function. And to me, it's very interesting. But to you guys, it is not important. All you need to know is, you know, hey, um, you know, Ethernet is not as fast as fast Ethernet, which is not as fast as gigabit Ethernet. So you kind of need to know what the speeds are. You know, one mechanism is faster than another mechanism. But you're not going to care if it was 570 milliseconds versus 390 milliseconds. That is not important. Do not get hung up around the axle about that stuff, okay? Do not worry about the formulas. They're only there to demonstrate mathematically how these things work, okay? And all you need to know is, hey, this is how a packet gets from computer A to computer B with all these devices in between them. And that's all you're focusing on. So focus on that as you're reading. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and I will make more videos as needed to help explain these concepts. Thank you very much.